Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Um, welcome to today's Senate lecture. I'm Glenn Ryle, the Director of Procedure and Research in the Department of the Senate. I would like to begin um, today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today's lecture is being live streamed on the APH website and through the broadcast system at Parliament House. So welcome also to everyone who is joining us online. Um, the lecture is also being captioned today as well. I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists, uh, Professor Anthony Gray and Professor, no Professor Greg Craven, to speak on the future of federal financial relations following the uh, decision of the High Court last year in Vanderstock. As many in the audience would be aware, there have been a number of important developments in federal financial relations over the last decade, largely initiated by the states. This has included the establishment of the Board of Treasurers in 2017, which is a body um, composing of all state and territory treasurers, and um, the New South Wales Review of Federal Financial Relations, which reported in 2020. Among other things, that review recommended that the Board of Treasurers give consideration to developing a national, nationally compatible and fair road user charging scheme. The charge would be collected and retained by the states and revenue raised would be hypothecated for expenditure on roads and other transport infrastructure. The review noted that electric vehicles could be used as a pilot and Victoria was the first state to legislate for such a scheme. Uh, this brings us to the topic of today's lecture, the Van der Stock decision, in which a narrow 4-3 majority of the High Court struck down Victoria's electric vehicle distance-based charge. To help us understand its very long decision, almost 400 pages, um, and its implications, we have the two eminent speakers with us today. Our first speaker is Professor Anthony Gray. Uh, Professor Gray commences a Professor of Law at the Bond Law School um, just this week, um, but prior to that, he was a Professor of Law at the University of Southern Queensland. He has authored approximately 150 refereed journal articles and numerous research monographs. His work has been cited by the High Court of Australia and the Supreme Courts of the United Kingdom and Canada. He very relevantly wrote his PhD on the topic excise taxation and the Australian Federation. Our second speaker will be Emeritus Professor Greg Craven AO. Professor Craven is a constitutional lawyer and former Vice Chancellor of the Australian Catholic University. He has written widely in the fields of constitutional law, particularly relating to federalism and judicial interpretation. Um, time permitting, at the conclusion of Pro Professor Craven's remarks, we'll have an opportunity for um, some discussion and questions from the audience. So would you please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Professor Gray. Thank you, uh, Glenn. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you today. So I thought we'd talk uh, briefly about the Vanistock decision, uh, what was decided and the context in which that decision was made, uh, and then talk about the broader implications of the, uh, of the case. Uh, and I'm aware that there'll be uh, people from a range of backgrounds here, so uh, I'll make judgments along the way about how much of the technical detail uh, I will go into, if, um, if, that, uh, if that makes sense. So, uh, in essence, the, the case uh, is about this Victorian uh, Z-Lev uh, uh, levy uh, imposed at a, a low rate on uh, users of those vehicles, 2 to 2.5 cents per kilometre during the financial year. Now, this is an unusual tax in that it's a tax on consumption. So we don't have those very often in our society, but a tax on consumption is, as it suggests, it's a tax, a tax on an act of consuming something. Now, we all know what we mean by consuming a, a food item, but what do we mean by consuming a vehicle? Okay, so this tax was imposed on the use of the vehicle. So as people uh, use their vehicle, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be taxed. Now, we generally have uh, a range of other taxes, so sales tax, uh, taxes on production, manufacture, uh, distribution, but this one was a tax on an act of consumption. Uh, now, as I say, I can't think of too many other times in our society where we've had uh, taxes on consumption. It's only been uh, considered by the High Court on uh, a handful of occasions. So the case was about whether uh, this tax on consumption was an excise, 
as you know, Section 90 of the Constitution says that the Commonwealth uh, cannot levy excise duties. And so the debate has raged for, for more than 120 years as to what we mean by the simple word excise. I mean, it sounds simple, doesn't it? We have a word in our Constitution, excise, and we're told that states cannot levy duties that are excises. So what do we mean by excise? Now, this is something that has bedeviled the court for some time. We had convention debates uh, back in the 1890s that considered the matter, but it's not, it wasn't particularly conclusive as to what the Founding Fathers intended. And in any event, the question of the relevance of the Founding Fathers' intentions uh, is somewhat uh, uncertain. Uh, in the Work Choices decision, and um, Professor Craven uh, has assured me that that's one of his favourite cases. Uh, in the Work Choices decision, one of the important things decided in that case uh, was that the High Court, or five justices, uh, five justices at least, of the High Court said that uh, basically the Founding Fathers' intentions were not determinative in terms of constitutional interpretation. I've given you uh, the, uh, the quote there that uh, constitutional uh, uh, answers are not found in, quote, attempting to attribute some collective subjective intention to all or any of those who participated in the convention debates. New South Wales versus the Commonwealth, uh, the work choices case. And so I, I regard that as the orthodoxy now in terms of constitutional interpretation that the meaning that the Founding Fathers, even if it could be determined uh, in relation to these matters, is not controlling, uh, is not determinative uh, and may not be important in terms of how we uh, resolve the matter today. Now, there's been um, a, quite a lengthy journey in terms of the history, and this is where I don't want to lose you by getting into too much of the, of the detail. Uh, if, if you want the detail, I'm happy to provide it uh, to you. But essentially, we've been arguing for a long time about uh, exactly what an excise tax is. And so originally, it was narrowly confined to a tax on goods at the stage of production or of manufacture. And that was in an early case, the Peters, Wool and Bartley uh, decision. But that was a decision uh, rendered at a time when we believed in uh, the reserved powers doctrine. Uh, and under that doctrine, the High Court determinedly uh, interpreted the Constitution having regard to the position of the states. Now, that method of constitutional interpretation was abandoned in 1920 uh, in the engineer's decision and has not been... Uh, that has not changed since 1920. So reserved powers reasoning, uh, reasoning by which you interpret the Constitution narrowly, having regard to the position of the states, that is heresy, uh, if I may put it in those terms, uh, in terms of the Constitution. It's been heresy since 1920. So the, although the Peters, Walden, Bartley case did say that uh, excise duties were confined to taxes on production or manufacture, it doesn't you put question marks at the very least over, over that uh, decision. Even so, uh, since that time, we've had cases that have extended the meaning of, of excise to include uh, taxes on the distribution, uh, taxes on the sale of goods. So cases like the Commonwealth Oil Refineries case uh, did that. Uh, and then we get to um, cases like Matthews, and in that case, uh, Justice Dixon, uh, he opined that uh, there was no reason why uh, an excise uh, tax could not include consumption taxes. Now, uh, those of, some of you will be aware of the reverence that uh, we generally have for Sir Owen Dixon, uh, but those of you who are, who are new to law, um, if I may observe that anything that Sir Owen Dixon says uh, is entitled to the, the very greatest uh, of respect. I mean, of course, we accord uh, respect to all High Court justices uh, and esteemed scholars. Uh, in respect of Sir Owen Dixon, he's on another level as far as I'm concerned. So that's why it's very noteworthy that uh, in the Matthews decision, uh, his honour thought that uh, there was no reason why uh, a consumption tax could not be uh, an excise. Now, he did uh, change his position. Uh, I'm not going to get into that uh, level of detail, but there was a Privy Council decision on the Canadian Constitution involving different terms, uh, and Sir Owen uh, believed that he uh, had to follow the Privy Council decision. So that caused him to change his view 
uh, in the cases, but it's pretty clear, I think, uh, as to what his actual view was from the Matthews decision, uh, he believed that an excise uh, could include uh, a tax on consumption. Uh, and the other thing that is very important in, the, in that era uh, in the Parton case, uh, Sir Owen talked about uh, the purpose of the section. Why, do we, why did the Founding Fathers decide to uh, forbid states from levying excise and customs duties? And he said uh, that it was designed to give the Commonwealth uh, a real control over taxation of commodities. So it was an implement of economic policy. We needed to give the Commonwealth this power uh, in order for the Commonwealth to manage the economy uh, in the way that, that uh, we would wish. Now that statement, uh, dicta, as it, or, you know, dicta comments, or, you know, comments that weren't necessary for the decision, uh, although they were of that nature, they have proven to be extremely influential uh, and have been accepted by later High Court justices. So that, that point is important uh, for what, uh, what follows. All right, uh, so then we had the 1960s where we went through a stage where the High Court was very technical, uh, had a, a very formalistic approach to the Constitution, cases like Bolton and Madsen. And then in the Dickinson's Arcade, it's one of the other few cases where we did actually consider a consumption tax and a majority of the court in that case did say that uh, a consumption tax could not be an excise, but it was, it was partly because of what had happened with those earlier cases uh, and the court believed they, they had to go along with what Sir Owen Dixon had done uh, and what had been apparently uh, decided uh, in Bolton and Madsen. So they, they were, you know, having read the case, uh, two of them, of the majority of four, were less than convinced uh, is my reading of it respectfully, but they went along with it. Uh, and two judges just dissented, uh, Chief Justice Barwick and Justice McTeen, and uh, said they couldn't go along with it. And they thought that uh, it was possible that a consumption tax could be uh, an excise. All right, so that's, and then, yeah, we, we've seen an evolution from the High Court's approach, from a, a very formalistic approach to a much more practical approach, uh, which has been continued uh, ever since. Uh, and that, that view of Justice Dixon about the Commonwealth having control over taxation of commodities, uh, that has certainly uh, flowed through since that time. So I, I think then, in terms of the law prior to Vanderstock now, so I, I hope you stayed with me through that. I know that was, that was a bit technical. I hope you're still with me. Uh, all right, so the, the anomaly in the law prior to this Vanderstock case, as I see it, uh, or a couple of anomalies, was that although the High Court agrees that the purpose of the section is to give the Commonwealth real control over taxation of commodities, well, they say that, but then they also say that, oh, well, no, well, you don't have control over consumption taxes, right? So you see how that, that in some ways, the High Court was at cross purposes in my mind, that although they understand the economic significance of the section, and they say that it's designed to give the Commonwealth control over taxation of commodities, but they're also saying that but it's not full control over taxation of commodities, it doesn't include consumption taxes. And similarly, while the High Court is now applying a practical approach to the interpretation of the Constitution, it is involved in technical arguments about, well, at which stage of these goods is the tax imposed. If it's imposed at the production stage, the manufacture stage, the distribution stage, or the sale phase, then that's apparently an excise. But if it were levied at the consumption phase, then that is not an excise. Now that, I think, is formalistic. Uh, and so, again, I think the High Court was at cross purposes. They were indicating that they were uh, adopting a practical approach, but they were also accepting these fine distinctions sometimes between where, at what precise stage, is the tax being imposed in relation to the movement of goods from the producer to the uh, end consumer. So I thought that uh, there was uh, an anomalous uh, situation. Uh, and states could then impede the Commonwealth's ability to manage the economy uh, through uh, its taxation uh, function. Um, yet I would suggest, uh, I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I would suggest that most would regard the Commonwealth as being the one in charge of uh, the economy and needing the tools to, uh, to implement um, its power in that regard. So I would say that the Vanderstock decision removed an anomaly from a law 
because the majority said that now a consumption tax could be an excise. There's no reason for stopping it at the distribution or sales stage. It can include uh, taxes on uh, consumption that is consistent with the purpose of the section to give the Commonwealth control over the taxation of commodities as an implement of economic management. So I applaud the decision for removing that anomaly uh, and stopping the law from being, uh, in my respectful view, uh, incoherent. Uh, they uh, also accept um, that uh, a tax on consumption will increase the cost of those goods to the consumer and it will generally, we, know, we don't want to get into a lot of the economics, but we all understand as, um, as intelligent people that if you uh, put more cost on a particular good, then the likelihood is that there will be less demand for that good. We all get that. Uh, and that's what the uh, majority judges uh, tapped into, saying that this would uh, impact on the cost of the goods and impact on demand for zero and low emission uh, vehicles and they provided a test. Is it a tax on goods and whether the tax affects the goods as subjects of manufacture? So whether they're likely to reduce demand for the goods. So that, that's, uh, that's the development. I don't think it's a radical uh, development. It's a slight extension of the uh, definition of excise. As I said at the start, consumption taxes are very rare animals. The High Court has considered it three occasions in the past 123 years. So the world is not going to end tomorrow because the, the majority decided uh, this decision in this way. It's likely, I think, to have relatively minimal impact uh, given that these taxes are extremely rare. All right, and so they uh, would invalidate the, uh, the provision and that's the view that, uh, that uh, was uh, upheld. Now, the dissentients um, spoke at, at some uh, length uh, and I've given them some uh, airtime up there. So Justice Gordon, uh, for instance, um, she agreed with the majority that there was no agreed view of um, excise at the time of federation. I think that's, that's correct. But she disagrees that the section's designed to give the Commonwealth control over the taxation of commodities. And she says, you cannot assume that a tax on consumption will affect demand. So they are two key areas of disagreement for Justice Gordon compared with the majority. She doesn't accept uh, the, the purpose of the section as espoused by the majority, uh, nor does she uh, accept a presumption that a tax on consumption uh, will affect uh, demand. She makes a, a few points that I might, um, with great respect, uh, question, if I may uh, put it in those terms. So uh, Her Honour says that uh, the majority's position would, quote, radically affect states' ability to raise revenue. Uh, I respectfully disagree. Uh, this uh, levy was not going to raise a lot of revenue. Uh, it was going to cost the typical owner of a vehicle around $300 per year. Uh, so in respect of every Victorian who drives a vehicle that is a zero or low emission vehicle paying $300 per year, uh, that's not a major revenue um, uh, base, I wouldn't have thought. So I, I must respectfully disagree, uh, and, I, and I understand it's not just about this tax, but it's about you know, what other taxes might be imposed, I get that. Uh, but I, having considered that, I, I must respectfully disagree that this decision will radically affect uh, their ability to raise revenue. Now, I, I also must respectfully disagree with, with this quoted passage from Justice Gordon. Uh, it was about the Commonwealth... Uh, that should be polity. I, I've just noticed that I've made a typo there. It was about the Commonwealth polity having most of the power to tax and the power to decide how that money is spent, but the states knowing what spending is needed, when and how. So that's how uh, Her Honour Justice Gordon uh, characterises our federation. Uh, respectfully, uh, I must disagree. It, it, if that is to suggest that state governments generally know what spending is needed, uh, when and how, that, sudden, that somehow the state governments know what's best and the federal government uh, doesn't know what's best. Uh, I must respectfully disagree. I don't think it's possible to simplify in that way and suggest that everything the state government spends uh, is informed and, and well managed and everything the federal government spends is, is inefficient and poorly managed. I, that I think is overly simplistic with respect uh, and so I, I can't agree 
uh, with Justice Gordon's view that the state governments know what spending is needed, when and how. And I, I've quoted her uh, carefully uh, in, in that key passage. Uh, now, I, I'm not an expert on Victorian politics uh, by any means, but uh, I guess we'd all be aware of the example of the Victorian Commonwealth Games uh, that was abandoned, um, the East-West uh, link that was abandoned. Um, there are a lot of questions about the suburban uh, rail loop in Melbourne uh, at the moment. So, you know, I could go on, but it, you get the idea. Uh, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that anyone could suggest that, uh, or should suggest, that states uh, know how to, what, they know what spending is needed, when and how, uh, in a way that the Commonwealth does not. I, I just don't, I cannot agree that, that we should uh, generalise about our governments uh, in that manner. She, uh, Her Honour, uh, also claims that the economic effects of a tax imposed at a consumption level are materially different from those imposed at a prior time. I'm not convinced, uh, respectfully, uh, that they are, but uh, I, I uh, of course, respect uh, Her Honour's view. Uh, and she accuses the majority of amending. That's the word she uses. She says that the majority is amending the Constitution. Uh, respectfully, I, I can't agree that uh, the High Court majority is doing that. Uh, they are interpreting the Constitution, which is their role. Uh, they're not amend they're, of course, clearly they're not literally amending the document. Uh, they're interpreting the document in a different manner than had been considered to be the case in the past, uh, which, as I say, is well within their remit, I would have thought. Uh, and just let me know how I'm going for time. So the other uh, dissenting judges, um, I've given you some of their comments. I, I might not dwell on, on some of that. I'll maybe pick up that second point that uh, Justice uh, Edelman and Justice Stewart both talked about the Ha case as reflecting a settlement and as being the end of a journey. Uh, and they say, well, now that, all that's been thrown up in the air with this decision. Well, I, I, again, I, I don't agree with that characterisation of, of the Ha case. I mean, most of us in constitutional law, we know that things change regularly. You know, we didn't know for, for 100, year or, you know, 100 years that the Commonwealth could legislate IR through the corporation's power. We found that out in the work choices case. There's been changes in the interpretation of Section 92, massive changes in relation to Section 90. So anyone um, who works in constitutional law knows that the area, it, it's constantly changing. So at no point would I respectfully characterise a judgment uh, as being a, a settlement or the end of a journey. Um, and I must say, even, even if it were regarded as a settlement and the end of a journey, uh, there are key aspects of uh, that settlement in Ha that these justices do not accept. Uh, they do not accept the view in Ha that uh, the Commonwealth uh, is, is um, to have real control over the taxation of commodities. Uh, these justices do not accept that. Uh, and the High Court in Ha specifically left open whether consumption taxes uh, were within the definition of an excise. So uh, there was no settlement, respectfully, regarding this precise issue uh, as to whether a consumption tax uh, was uh, an excise or not. OK, uh, so I've, I've quoted Justice Edelman uh, there at Paris 613. He accuses the majority decision of, quote, a neglect of constitutional structure, neglect of constitutional text, neglect of contemporary understanding, neglect of history, neglect of political choice, neglect of economics, neglect of principle, neglect of precedent, neglect of authority and neglect of the future. All right, so apart from that, I, I think uh, Justice Edelman was uh, respectfully was, was happy with the majority <laughs> view. All right, so you, you see the, the level of uh, dissent. Uh, you know, the, this is a highly charged uh, decision. Uh, there are obviously passionately held views uh, on all uh, sides. And these judges uh, did uh, refer to the, the Founding Fathers' views. And they thought that the Founding Fathers intended uh, that the section would be narrowly focused on production or manufacture. That's according to Justice Stewart uh, and Justice Edelman. Uh, there is very limited evidence. I mean, Justice Edelman, very scholarly, obviously, uh, he referred to... Uh, one uh, speech by a founding father and he referred to a Victorian audit committee around the time of federation uh, for evidence as to what the founding fathers intended the section to mean. I don't know whether, respectfully, uh, that is sufficient to, to you know, imply that that, that was the uh, uh, view held by all. All right, so that's probably uh, enough in relation to 
uh, that decision. Uh, so I, I, I've indicated that I uh, disagree with what the uh, minority have, uh, have said uh, because I, I think clearly a consumption tax does overall uh, affect the price of goods to the consumer. Uh, so it does generally have an economic effect um, and that should be borne in mind. This issue about the Founding Fathers uh, is, um, is important. So as I say, the Work Choices decision uh, said that the Founding Fathers' intentions should not, even though they could be discerned, should not uh, be determinative in terms of interpretation. Uh, to pursue the identification of the framers' intention much more often than not is to pursue a mirage. The answer to whether a measure is constitutional or not is not to be found in attempting to attribute some collective subjective intention to all or any of those who participated in those debates. Now, we must contrast that with um, a fellow by the name of Craven. Uh, he's an esteemed um, constitutional scholar, of course, and uh, his views are entitled to the greatest of respect. Uh, in, he, he uh, in his writings, has a very different view, and I've quoted, I'm sure you won't mind me quoting one of his articles uh, in 1992, uh, that um, Professor Craven says, in the interpretation of the Australian Constitution, the search for the intentions of those who framed the document is paramount. So you see the, the difference of views. We have now a majority of the High Court saying that the Founding Fathers' views are not controlling, uh, they're, they're not to be utilised in this manner, other people uh, have a, a very different view, and of course that, that applies in relation to this context. The other thing I'd, I'd mention is that uh, dissenters uh, Edelman and, uh, and Justices Edelman and Stewart uh, also use the concept of direct and indirect. Uh, now that has a, a loaded history in constitutional interpretation. I'm not going to. I don't have time to get into it today, but just to say that. Uh, we went through a stage in relation to Section 92 interpretation uh, that we made that distinction between direct and indirect. It was abandoned in the Colin Whitfield decision uh, as being unsatisfactory. So I, I'm not sure respectfully about the wisdom of seeking to reintroduce uh, distinctions that elsewhere in the Constitution uh, debate uh, have been uh, found wanting. All right, a few more minutes. Okay, so the, the, I guess the, the broader implications then, I've got a few quotes up there that really talk about the, uh, the design that the Constitution evolve over time. Okay, so I've got Justice Jacobs in the Victoria uh, case, Justice Windier in the Victorian Commonwealth case, uh, Sir Anthony Mason in his papers, uh, and the Business Council uh, did some good work on uh, federalism uh, nearly 20 years ago. And they're all expressing a similar view, which is that the Constitution needs to adapt. Okay, so we're not the society that we were in the 1890s. We're in the, the 2020s. Things are happening that the Founding Fathers could not have foreseen. And we need to find some way of having flexibility uh, in our constitutional uh, arrangements. All right, so I've given you some examples uh, in there that my general sense is that in the 1890s we had a, a, a bunch of uh, loosely associated colonies obviously didn't have a lot to do with one another. They're very isolated. Transport links were primitive. Communication links were primitive. We have a very different uh, society today. We are a tightly integrated federation. Uh, very easy to get around to uh, travel and communicate. Businesses are generally now structured on a national or international level. Uh, and so the, the constitution really doesn't work, if I may say, with the greatest of respect in relation to the way our society is uh, today. We have now a concept of Australian citizenship, uh, a realisation that most issues have a national and or international character, globalisation. So I don't have time to get into specifics today, but things like the aged care sector and the NDIS, I'm glad that you know there are inefficiencies in there, but I, I'm glad that that's something that's run at the federal level. I don't see a reason why an aged care facility would be paid this amount of money if it were in Victoria, but this amount of money if it were in Queensland, or if the mandated uh, time that a nurse would spend with a patient would be 60 minutes in New South Wales, but 90 minutes in WA. I mean, I'm giving you simple examples, but you, you get the idea that the, the sense of having eight different regimes for a lot of things doesn't exist anymore in my uh, respectful view, but our constitution is written as if that's the way our country is, but the problem is that our country isn't that way and it's not going to go back to being that way in my view. So business, um, so obviously business expects 
uh, national company law, national industrial relations, which we do have, but we still have a range of state regulation of business, so OH&S uh, recognition of qualifications, national discrimination laws would be ideal, payroll tax, workers' compensation. So anyone running a business in Australia has to deal with eight different sets of provisions relating to all of that, or all, you know, all of that apart from the first two. And I would argue that that's highly uh, inefficient. Uh, our constitution has changed very little uh, in express terms since Federation. We've only had eight changes, most of them minor, uh, since Federation. And another quote I thought was interesting, James Buchanan speaking about the US constitution. Uh, he spoke about the challenges of the progressive national integration of the economic system within a decentralised political structure. Now, he's speaking about the United States, but I think that's very apt, uh, if I may say, to our context. All right, so how, do us, how does our governance work in, in three minutes? Uh, well, it, it's, it's difficult because the Constitution provides uh, various heads of power to the Commonwealth, but then says to the states, well, you've got to deal with the rest. But the problem is that, most, that many uh, topics now are seen as requiring a national approach, that the, the desire for uh, efficiency, consistency, uh, in terms of business, low cost, regulatory environment, uh, it means there's more demands for the Commonwealth to do things. So the NDIS uh, would be one uh, example, aged care. Uh, whereas back in the 1890s, they weren't you know, in terms of the, on the radar in terms of policy. So the Commonwealth raises the biggest taxes by revenue, so income tax, corporate tax and GST. Uh, the states have uh, limited revenue bases, so they levy payroll tax, land tax, stamp duty, mining royalties, etc. We do have a high level of vertical fiscal imbalance, so the Commonwealth raises more money and it doesn't spend uh, as much, whereas the states spend more than they can, they can raise. So that's the, the challenge we have in terms of our uh, fiscal uh, arrangements, this mismatch. And so the Commonwealth is controlling areas, so it's, it's controlling NDIS and aged care, but it has no direct constitutional authority over those areas. Uh, so that's generally not ideal, uh, but that's the way it works uh, at the moment in terms of um, the, the Commonwealth uh, and the Constitution. And it's really the Commonwealth's spending power, uh, the Commonwealth's ability to spend money, that I think has created the necessary fluidity in our constitutional arrangements. So because the federal government has more of the money, it is able to indirectly influence areas like higher education, uh, schooling, et cetera, to provide the kind of national and coordinated approach that most people, I think, would, would want, even though they've got no direct constitutional power. So that's how it kind of works, but it's not something that anyone would design as being the best way for a system to work. So it, it, it kind of works, but it, it's not what I would uh, suggest in an ideal world. All right. So I'll leave that one. OK, I've got there the, the costs of federalism. So some scholars have attempted to put a cost on the, the federalist uh, structure that we have in this country. Uh, and the costs are, are eye-watering, if I may say. So Access Economics uh, estimated that the cost of our federal system is $9 billion per year. Uh, and that was in 2006. And that's only the personal cost to households. Uh, a report that I've quoted uh, it referred to comments from a CEO of a large corporation uh, where that person said that they were crippled in growth by excessive business regulation associated with a range of state laws, that their growth was 15% per year, but if there were consistent regulation uh, across the country, their growth would double, that their regulation compliance costs were about 1% of their yearly revenue, and without, um, without that, uh, their revenue would have been uh, 24 to 30 million dollars per year more, and they would pay 8 to 10 more in uh, tax to the government. Access Economics estimated the cost of inefficient state taxes at 4 billion per year, and another academic has uh, costed the federal structure at 20 billion dollars per year. All right, so these are not my figures; these are figures of, of people who economists economists who have uh, done their their sums and. I don't think uh, that is um, a satisfactory uh, arrangement. Extremely high cost uh, of our federal system, uh, the inefficiencies, uh, the difficulties for business operating across uh, state lines. We're running about 10 minutes over time. 10 minutes over time. Okay, so let me, uh, maybe I'll finish with my wish list. 
Okay, so uh, if, if it were up to me, look, I do think, uh, and I know this is going to sound radical, but I do think we need a new constitution. Uh, it's a lot to expect of a document uh, written in the 1890s to be good for the 2020s and beyond. So I think we do need a, a rethink. Uh, so we need to work out which responsibilities we would give to the federal government and which responsibilities we would give to the state governments uh, and decide on, on a rationale for that and areas where hopefully different levels of government can work together. I do think that the Commonwealth needs to raise taxation, so they must retain control over income, corporate and GST type tax. I think we need to make our company tax system more competitive. We are uncompetitive at the moment on a world scale given our uh, corporate tax uh, rates. Most people in uh, ec economics, economics will say we need less uh, uh, reliance on income tax. We have very high uh, income tax rates and we have um, relatively low uh, GST type taxes. So we could do with a rejig uh, there. Inefficient state taxes such as uh, payroll tax, such as stamp duty, uh, they would be removed in an ideal system. And we need to find other ways, obviously, of raising revenue, but there are better ways of, of uh, doing so. So land tax is a relatively efficient tax. Dare I say it, death duties, uh, super profits taxes, those, I think, need to be in the mix uh, rather than uh, some of what we're relying on at the moment. And I do think we need a serious conversation about uh, the role of government in our society. We must live within our means. Uh, we must keep federal uh, and state government spending under control. And I'll finish with uh, a comment uh, by uh, Sir Alfred Deakin, uh, one of our founding fathers, uh, was Prime Minister three times, as you may be aware. And he spoke about, when he was uh, introducing the bill that would create the High Court, uh, he said this, Our written constitution, large and elastic as it is, is necessarily limited by the ideas and circumstances which obtained in the year 1900. Formal amendment is a comparatively costly and difficult task, and one which will be attempted only in grave emergencies. In the meantime, the statute stands and will stand on the statute book, just as in the hour in which it was assented to. But the nation lives, grows and expands. Its circumstances change, its needs alter and its problems present themselves with new faces. The organ of the national life which, while preserving the union, is yet able from time to time to transfuse into it the fresh blood of the living present is the judiciary, the High Court of Australia. It is one of the organs of government which enables the constitution to grow and be adapted to the changeful necessities and circumstances of generation after generation that the High Court operates. So this is the founding father, one of our leading founding fathers, who says in 1902 that our High Court does have a role in interpreting the constitution and in ways that the founding fathers may not have uh, intended. This is the genius of our constitution that it was designed to endure but also to breathe, and I would suggest that we must let it breathe. Thank you. Thank you, and I invite Professor Craven to um, give his uh, thoughts on the decision. And of course, feel free to take the extra time. Um. Sorry, I shall try not to. Um, so that was a, a far-ranging presentation uh, in the sense that Western Australia is, is quite big. Uh, and there's a lot of complexity in this. There's complexity uh, of a wider sort and there's complexity in relation to Section 90. Whenever I used to teach constitutional law, I would try and give the class one thing to hang on to. So whenever you're worried, whenever you're feeling confused, you need to repeat this to yourself. I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> so just, 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 I won't ask you to chant that. I, I'd just like you to, to remember it. Um, I realise that I have now been a constitutional lawyer for exactly 40 years. So I have not been getting a lot of social invitations since I was about 24 years old. Um, but I have to say, I have never sunk so low as to be an expert on Section 90. Uh, this, this really is one of the most extraordinarily boring sections uh, of the Constitution. Uh, the last time I spoke upon it was 27 years ago, and I do now only under extreme provocation, and I am delighted to see 
that the number of people physically present here is less than the number 90. So it's a, a tribute uh, to you that you have uh, done this. Um, look, I, I totally agree with Professor Gray. There are really two ways you can look at the whole question of Section 90 and indeed van der Stock. Um, one is a technical way. Yeah, OK, what does this mean for Section 90? What does excise mean? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Those sorts of things. And there's a broader way in which you can look at it in the sense of where is the High Court going, which is a perennial question and not easy to answer, possibly even for the High Court uh, at any given time. And how are they going to get there? So it's this partly, OK, what is it, partly what's it going to be? And that's the second question that I'm really going to do. I'm going to try as much as possible not to go into the murky intestines of Section 90, although I will to some extent have to puddle around in its guts. But, but I want to try and look at the trend. Where do we think it's going and what are the implications? And, and I think you can divide even that into three types of areas. One is the decision the scope of what is an exercise. As I say, I really don't want to talk about that. But given this is a bad exercise, I sort of feel I'm obliged to say something about the word. Um, what the way van der Stock handled exercise says about the interpretive method of the High Court and where that's going long term, which is probably the most important question, unless it's the third question, which may be more important, which is, well, what is the expression, the decision in van der Stock doing in relation to some really important things in the Constitution, mainly federalism? And may I say, with the extraordinary loathing for federalism uh, that we saw from my colleague, I can only assume that uh, while she was pregnant, his mother was frightened by federalism uh, because it seems to extend it through, through every gene in his body. Um, in terms of it being a decision about excise, we, we need to remember that Section 90 is fundamentally uh, a question about federalism. Uh, the wider the interpretation of Section 90 in terms of what a tax, the type of taxes the state can't impose, the less financially independent the states will be, the narrower the interpretation of Section 90, the more financial freedom the states will have and correspondingly the less power the Commonwealth will have. I, I take without insult uh, all those comments about how hopeless the states are in spending money, uh, how incompetent they are in every way. I am influenced in no way but in this uh, view by the fact that I was Crown Counsel for Victoria uh, for three years. But every time I hear about the incompetence of the states and the glorious omniscience of the Commonwealth, I think of things like nuclear submarines. <laughs> indefinite detention of refugees, internment of Italian waiters during World War II. Quite right, the Commonwealth's never got a thing wrong uh, in 100 years. Now, historically, what the High Court has done with Section 90 and Excise, given what I said about the effects on federalism, is it's swung between purity uh, and practicality. So the purity thing says, oh, we're going to figure out what Section 90 means and we're going to be a tough high court, we're going to do this exactly according to judicial method. And the practicality says, well, actually, we do realise that if we give a wide meaning to Section 90, we are going to bankrupt the states. Uh, and given that the states actually have to do quite a lot of things, that could be a problem. It could even be a problem for the Commonwealth if the states don't have enough money. And therefore, we're going to have to try and come to some sort of practical conclusion, which Professor Gray clearly likes, uh, practical conclusions. Um, and the reality is that this represents in van der Stock a decisive step away from that type of practical federalism uh, that the High Court has often stuck to. That in a sense, this is an absolutist decision. It's not a decision that says, will this work? It's not a decision that says we're going to take account of vertical and fiscal imbalance. This is a decision that says this is what it means and we don't care what happens, which is strikingly uh, similar to the High Court uh, in the, I can never get the acronym right, X, Y and Z case. If you were talking to uh, Mark Dreyfus right now, he'd say 
Now, he wouldn't be talking about... He wouldn't be using the word respectfully about the High Court. He would be saying those bastards have released large numbers of vicious internees out in the country and they're hurting people and they didn't care and I'm left holding the basket. They're quite similar decisions. They're, they're highly uh, theoretical, highly purist. They don't care uh, about practical results. Now, I would say that it is very difficult, even for me, to work out the actual ratio in this case. So, yes, we've got a majority. Da, da, da. I find it very hard to work out exactly what they're saying. That might be my deficiency. It's possible it may be their deficiency. It's possible it may be both our deficiencies. Um, but realistically, I mean, I, I hear we've had poor old Justice Gordon slightly dis uh, for her dissent. I think she's pretty well right. If I was a state administrator, which I was once, I'd be looking at this and I'm thinking, well, potentially any state tax in respect of goods could be an excise. And why that's important is that when I was Crown Counsel and I was dealing with these constitutional matters, one of the things you actually have to do as a state is you have to plan. And if you're going to plan, you have to have a level of certainty. And the thing you have to have absolute certainty about is your revenue sources. And it seems to me that one of the things that emerges from this is that a state can have no idea about the certainty of its resources in respect of taxes which relate in any way to goods. And I, I sadly am rather... I mean, I, I'm, I'm fond of Justice Gordon. Uh, I was responsible for having her appointed to her first judicial position. Um, I think there's something in it when she says the Constitution has been amended. So basically what you had, Section 90 says a particular type of taxes in respect of goods uh, are not allowed to the states being excises. And when you look at this at the end, are you absolutely confident, as Greg Craven, Crown Counsel, uh, advising the greatest politician who has ever existed in this country, Jeff Kennett, that he can in fact levy this tax but not that tax? Uh, and, and you clearly... You clearly can't. Now, of course, decisions vary, things develop. I think we were talking before, I was saying it's really a question of equilibrium. We thought perhaps we'd reached a position of equilibrium uh, with Ha, but we're out of equilibrium and we're out of certainty. And having read this thing pretty carefully, I cannot figure out where excise starts and stops. Yes, there's got to be a close relationship with good. What the hell's a close relationship? It has to have some effect on the market. Terrific. What effect on the market? It's got to affect demand. Well, how is it going to affect demand? And when you try and figure out what else could end up in excise, and when we do this as academics, we always take the most exaggerated possible case and, and then embroider it, you really do start to wonder, um, would a tax on petrol, and we all know there are taxes on petrol, you can have a tax on petrol, would that be an excise if it was imposed by the states. I would have thought, yes, no, there he is, he nods. You know, yes, who cares? No problems. Yeah, the states can go bankrupt, not on my watch. Okay. That, that's an interesting question. Car licensing. You know, everybody should ride a bike. Uh, so the effect of having licenses on cars but not bikes, well, is that in there? Differential licensing fees between goods in the same class. For example, licensing fees on packaging. Now, plastic packaging versus other sorts of packaging. Uh, packaging between glass, packaging between plastic. The level of unclarity in this decision rivals a speech by Donald Trump. <laughs> and one of the things the law should be is clear. So thank you very much, the High Court. So the second thing, charging enthusiastically away from the meaning of excise, is what it says about judicial method. And that's important because it says how the High Court's going on. Um, the judicial method in van der Stock is singular. As you all know, the lawyers in this room, singular is a legal word which means crapulous. This is singular reasoning. Uh, in the sense that it's, it's very unusual, one is uh, in the way I've said before that it's totally abstract. Uh, it's very different from many of the Section 90 cases, many of the 92 cases, that it has no interest in the effect on the federal balance at all. That's just a problem for someone else. That's a case, it is true 
Occasionally in the majority, they do make a couple of pious references uh, to federalism. I call that crocodile federalism, as in crocodile tears. Yeah, you've got to say something about federalism. Now we can get on to something more interesting. Um, there are some really obvious sort of technical things that are a little bit embarrassing. One is it's just so bloody long. Yeah, couldn't the High Court reduce it by a couple of hundred thousand paragraphs? Yeah, Judge Gordon's dissent, which I'm very fond, I read through, it has more footnotes than the average minor thesis. And then, of course, the majority is pretty much the same sort of thing. Do we really need something quite like that? Again, the question is, wouldn't certainty be a bit nice? The fact that the court is so hopelessly split uh, in terms of different views doesn't help. The use of history is really very interesting, particularly to me, the use of the convention debates, because when I was 27, I was stupid enough to get the convention debates republished with an index which I had to write. It took me about four years. The reason I say that is I am the last person to personally know the founding fathers. I know every single one of them because I had to read every speech they'd ever said. And I always thought that if I did this, it would have the great effect of allowing the history of the Constitution to enlighten the Constitution when being used by the High Court. What I would say about van der Stock is that the history of the Constitution was used so far as possible to absolutely confuse the attentions, intentions of, of the founders. Now, that's actually not particularly surprising on Section 90 because it's true. It's hard to tell. I can remember someone uh, saying to me that their grandfather had spoken to Alfred Deacon and what it was about. And Deacon said, isn't it about fags and grog? Uh, it was somehow or other about cigarettes and hard to get that, but that's what Deacon thought. Um, what I think is most interesting about the interpretation of Section 90, uh, 90 here is it fits into a genre of constitutional interpretation, which I would call uh, scheme interpretation. We don't look at the words that much. Uh, we don't even look, look at the history. What we look at it as, what is the great theme of the Constitution here and how do we interpret Section 90 in relation to the great theme? And the High Court majestically moves on, again, as Professor Gray said, and the great theme is the customs union of the Australian Federation. Nothing must be allowed to undermine the Commonwealth's control of customs duties of the whole internal external trade in Australia and therefore Section 90 must be subject and absolutely subject to that. Which is interesting because there are other great themes of the Constitution. There's even this theme called federalism, which is the great scheme of the Constitution in which the High Court is utterly uninterested. So this idea of a great scheme, Section 92, the custom union of the Australian Federation, it's very interesting that the High Court has resort to this interesting concept, the dismal science, called economics. And it is enormously confident as it wades through the possible economic effect of excises in this particular context. Now, can I say to you that history has revealed that letting the High Court loose uh, on economics is letting, like letting a wildebeest loose on playing Beethoven. They do not know what they're talking about. They do not have degrees in economics. They have not read large numbers of uh, economic tracts. Uh, their conclusions on economics are fundamentally disputable and indeed unlikely to be right. And if you don't believe that, have a look at their wonderful decision in Cole and Whitfield on section 92, which is a decision about whether the Tasmanians uh, were protecting Tasmanian crayfish against South Australian crayfish. And after enormous economic analysis, the High Court came to the decision, this, that and the other thing. Now, I can remember having lunch in University House Melbourne University, myself, Cheryl Saunders, Michael Cromlin, and somehow or other we lured a high officer of the Tasmanian Fisheries Department 
to have dinner with us. And being a Tasmanian, he had never drunk wine before. And as it went on, he got more and more loquacious. And originally he said, oh, no, it wasn't a customs duty, no. And eventually, almost falling over the table, he began to say, God, we screwed those South Australians. We got our Tasmanian crayfish up. That high court, it wouldn't know a crayfish from a yabby. Well, why on earth is the high court so confident of its, of its economic capacity. It actually starts talking about, well, you know, these are forming practical judgments, which is what the law is here to do. No, it's not. It's applying economic theory by a group of people who wouldn't actually know how to buy a tram ticket. And that is a major methodological problem, that the interpretation of excise may have been artificial before, but it's now economics being performed by people who are not economists. But as I say, I think one of the most interesting things about it is this idea of the grand scheme. That when you interpret the Constitution, you find a grand scheme and that resolves all of the historical and interpretive problems. And as I say, you can choose your grand scheme. Now, if I were choosing a grand scheme, I'd choose the grand grand scheme which is federalism. For every quote you can find for Alfred Deakin about the High Court interpreting the Constitution, and I would refer you to a particularly brilliant article by a man called Craven uh, called Heresy as Orthodoxy, Were the Founding Fathers Progressivist? And the answer is a resounding no. For every single point you can find about interpretation, you can find literally 500 about why it is that the Australian Constitution is federal. So I think in this case, we've got judges picking the great theme, which is in fact the minor theme uh, that they like. It's interesting if you, if you try and, so it's great, it's great scheme interpretation. If you to try and really be pernickety and, and, and distill it down to its, its bits, it's actually very interesting. It's not an interpretation that's literalist, which is engineers. It's not an interpretation that's progressivist, which is, well, what's the right answer? Um, it's an, an interesting combination. It, it looks at the words literally. It then looks at the words historically. It then looks at the words in context. And to some extent, it then tries to come to the right decision. Um, that's what I've always called contextualism. And it's actually the theory I like, but I think applied here uh, in the particular way it is, it is certainly not a success. So then you get the question, of which direction, what, what does all this mean for the High Court? Well, it's interesting. On one level, you could say, taken with the X, Y and Z case, it appears that the High Court has returned to its tr uh, two classic obsessions. One is of beating up the states and one is of preserving their own judicial power. That's the history of the High Court. Seems, seems they're back on track. Uh, it seems very, very clear that they are now interested in a restrictive view of federalism. Uh, they don't like the states. Now, they haven't historically. They certainly don't know. I actually wonder the extent to which that's a reflection of the COVID experience. Remember how before COVID we all thought we were one country uh, and the rest of it, and suddenly in COVID we were of these six sovereign states? You wonder uh, to the extent that that might interpret the psychology uh, of the High Court. Um, probably the most interesting thing is, is where the grand scheme theme of interpretation goes. Here, it goes in an anti-federal uh, scheme. Uh, it could go in other ways. You know, if you remember the judgments of Justice Dean uh, and cases like Cable and the cases that created the so-called uh, implied rights, uh, they were grand scheme things. They were grand schemes in representative democracy. It was the grand scheme of the Constitution. So we can invent these implied rights because that's consistent with that grand scheme. It's interesting that they're doing grand scheme stuff again. And you wonder, well, if they've done this with Section 90, will the train that parked in the station with implied rights take off again uh, on the same sort of reasoning? Um, this stuff about economics could go in a lot of different ways in the Constitution. For example, Section 109 about inconsistency of Commonwealth and state laws, mercifully the High Court has not started to get into contrasting economic effects of state and Commonwealth laws. Uh, they could. 
Uh, interestingly, the High Court does like history. It enjoys going into the convention debates. Uh, I am pleased it might increase the sales of the convention debates, which is good for me. I am worried because when the High Court is let loose on things other than law, it usually gets carried away. So famously in the season submerged lands case, the counsel in that case said the moment they gave the High Court maps, historic maps, they were lost. You know, the, the High Court could cheerfully have spent the next hundred years uh, plotting the boundaries uh, of Australia. And as I say, it also gets uh, the High Court into an area where it just isn't interested in practical effects. And, and that can be a problem. I'm not saying high courts shouldn't apply the law, but I am saying they need to think of context. Look, the final thing, which I wasn't going to say, because my colleague has, has brought it up, I'll, I'll say it briefly. Now, this is this whole thing uh, about founders' intent, uh, upon which I've sort of based my life. So it's very important that it doesn't get dissed very often. Um, I just say this. Is it so astonishing that if you're interpreting a document, you might want to work out what the people who wrote the document thought when they were writing it? You know, if you were writing a contract, would you say, well, it doesn't really matter uh, what people think it, or what they think I said, it's just what they feel. I call this the Jane Austen in approach to constitutional interpretation. If you want to believe that Jane Austen is about Marxism, you can, uh, but it doesn't mean that it is. Uh, the second point is um, that it's not true that you usually cannot get an idea of the founder's intent. I think in this case it probably is true. It's too hard to figure out exercise. Uh, but there are some things where it is blindingly obvious what the founder's intent. An uh, example I would give was the corporation's power. So this idea you can never find it, I think, is, is quite disingenuous. Um, we may recall that the Founding Fathers had one interesting characteristic that the High Court didn't. They were actually elected. Not on a universal suffrage, but the question you have to ask is, how did you vote in the last vote for the Chief Justice of the High Court? Now, how, how did you cast your vote? Um, I suppose another point is to say, why the hell would you want to let loose seven judges trained in the law on making up the Constitution as they go along, when every time they do it, it has fundamental effects on Australian society. I used to say to my classes, you know, look around, find a High Court judge. There's one, there's me. We could easily have ended up High Court judges. I would say to them, what is it that most instills you with astonishing faith in near 70-year-old white Australian men? Uh, to run the Constitution. And the final point I'd make is that all these discussions about, oh, but otherwise we can never change the Constitution. The judges have got to do us for us. Actually, we, we can change the Constitution under Section 128 with a referendum. Now, no one has suffered more from referendum than me. You know, I'm one, I think I'm the only person who held high office both in the Republican referendum and in the voice referendum. But at the end of the day, that amendment process may not be perfect, but it's sure as hell a hell of a lot more democratic than working out a majority of seven High Court judges who, may I say, are appointed by the wicked executive of the Commonwealth. So I think that whole discussion, I hadn't intended to go into this, it's a matter of self-defence I have, that whole discussion uh, needs to be a hell of a lot more delicate than we typically do. Um, I'm not fight frightened of a federalism. Uh, my mother didn't encounter one when she was pregnant. And I think the idea that federalism is sort of a mutant form of government is really quite a bad one. It's interesting, if you go around the world and you try and identify successful constitutional democracies, it's astonishing how many of them are federations. So on that uplifting note and reminding you that I am right about everything, uh, I leave you. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Craven and also to Professor Gray earlier. Um, you've definitely given us a lot to think about it with your very differing perspectives on the decision and federalism in general. Um, we, have, we are running a few minutes over time, so 
I don't know whether you might be willing to stay for five minutes for a few questions from the audience, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? And if you're interested, yes, we have um, someone up here. Just um, we'll bring a microphone to you. Thank you for two very interesting presentations. <clears throat> two quick points. One, intentions of founders. Are there not some salutary lessons coming from the US Supreme Court lately on originalism concepts and capacity of judges to convincingly delve into history? And two, on how elastic our constitution currently is, thought of both in legal and political terms. For example, if this Van der Stock decision meant car rego money, for example, was questioned, would we not see some kind of workaround like federal savings legislation? Um, you know, in the same way that pre, prior to that change in the interpretation of the corporation's power on industrial relations, there was that whole edifice of legal fictions on disputes and so on that kind of made things work. So do we really have to be thinking of something as drastic and unlikely as a new constitution? Thank you. Look, I think, is this on? Okay. I think the idea that originalism is always bad and that progressivism is always right is just not wrong, it's not correct. Um, if you look at some of the uh, decisions of the American Supreme Court uh, that you would probably dislike most, uh, they would be progressivist decisions. So for many, many years, uh, the amendment on equal protection was used to wipe out labour laws, uh, protection for unions. Uh, and that was not on the basis of originalism. It was really on the basis uh, of a quite determined progressivism. Um, in terms of the limitations of the Australian Constitution and its amendment, as I say, the problem is the amendment procedure is a lot more democratic than progressivism. You might not like it, uh, but it is. And a lot of the referenda that have failed, the real reason they failed was because they were bloody awful ideas. Uh, and it's a good thing that they failed, unlike The Voice, which was a brilliant idea, um, because I was involved in it. Um, <laughs> The third point is, yes, you can sort of say, oh, well, the Commonwealth will come for a workaround. What if it doesn't? Now, the Commonwealth doesn't always do workarounds. The Commonwealth never did a workaround uh, in the surplus revenue case. Often the Commonwealth, if it gets power, it's a lovely president wrapped up uh, with a red ribbon. You can't have a system that there's no system I know that's ever worked, remember Glyn Davis saying this, which consists of having a power and relying upon the fact that it will never be used. So I think practicality is a little different. I think we, we can uh, reach a workaround. My understanding is that the, the federal government is looking, in the light of the Vanderstock decision, that the federal government is looking at ways in which uh, there might be some kind of uh, national regime, for instance, in relation to uh, imposing uh, levies uh, of the type that were invalidated in Vanderstock. Uh, the idea being that perhaps that the, the money would be then distributed to, to states on some uh, equitable basis. And that's indeed what happened after the, uh, the Ha uh, decision of the High Court. Uh, we ended up uh, with the passage of the GST. So certainly we, we have workarounds. With originalism, I, I just, I mean, as I tried to uh, demonstrate, founding fathers themselves uh, did not intend that uh, their intentions, even if they could be discerned, uh, would be controlling in terms of the document. They, the, the very legislation that set up the High Court, Deakin said that the idea is that the High Court uh, be able to uh, adapt the Constitution over time. So I, I think it's pretty hard to uh, defend the Founding Fathers' views being controlling or, or extremely important, with all due respect for them, uh, because they didn't intend it themselves. Uh, and we are a very different nation. I mean, you think the way this, uh, this place was in the 1890s and you think of the way it is today. Uh, I mean, I have, I have so much admiration for the Founding Fathers and our constitutional arrangements, but I can't expect anyone to write a document today that will be good for whatever the world will look like in 130 years' time. I, I just don't think that that's practical. Yeah, I, th I think this is a point of fundamental disagreement. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure you've read the authoritative article I wrote in, 
hideous detail. Um, but the question would be this. If you think something's truly terrible in the Australian Constitution, that is so awful that any sane person would realise it was awful, why don't you have a referendum? I mean, if it's that clear, I mean, your problem, your problem if you don't want to have a referendum, it's, it's, you haven't got a problem with the Constitution. You've got a problem with democracy. That's a difficulty. Well, well let, let's just uh, say that there are different views as to what democracy uh, looks like. Perhaps we leave it at that. OK, well, uh, thank you to uh, Professor Gray and Cr Professor Craven. We, have, we are now 10 minutes over time, so I think we might have to wrap it up then, but it was really great to get your differing insights. Thank you very much. Um, our next lecture will be on the 28th of June, and it will actually be the inaugural President's Lecture hosted by the President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Sue Lyons, um, award-winning broadcast journalist and gender equity advocate, Virginia Hauska AM, will be um, presenting on the topic, 30 Shades of Grey and Grievance, Women, Politics and the Gender Agenda. So we do hope you can join us then on the 28th of June. Um, so that concludes our formal proceedings, other than to again thank Professor Cray, Prof Professor Craven and Professor Gray for such an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you.